I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editorial Director of Low Power High Performance Engineering. I'm here with Catherine Cranin, who is the President and CEO of Jasper and also the Chairman of EDEC. Catherine, when you look out at the industry these days, where are the real pain points? Well, we see three kind of new pain points in the industry. Uh, one of them is around low power, and that shouldn't come as a surprise, of course, especially given the name of uh, your publication. <laughs> you have low power, you have multiprocessor, uh, cache coherent designs, and you have security, hardware security and software security. And what's happened is it used to be each of these was a, an isolated problem set for a specific segment. You had low power in the handsets and uh, multiprocessing for big compute servers, and you had uh, security, really only a special few. And now we have almost every product in every electronic segment is dealing with all three of these simultaneously. So it's pretty much created a perfect storm in verification. When we think about verification, though, we tend to think of it as a you run through your design and then the verification's at the end. Power tends to run all the way through a design. So when you're thinking about verifying power, you really have to think of it almost universally in the design, right? Well, there are many aspects to low power design and verification, you know, not to mention optimization and uh, things that affect the physical implementation as well. So one of the things that we at Jasper are focused on is how to make sure that, in, that the intent, the power intent of the power management scheme is actually been implemented correctly, as well as did your power management scheme break your functionality? And that's something that's not served well by the many, many other types of power-related EDA tools. We see a lot in the uh, power estimation, power optimization spaces, and a lot of structural design rule checks that simply check, did you insert level shifters the way my UPF or CPF file specified? When really those don't check, was that file correct in the first place? Was the intent followed? And did we verify uh, that functionality wasn't broken? So there are things all throughout the entire SOC design cycle, but what we have chosen to address are the two areas that we think are the most critical for risk reduction in low power designs. You know, power management has become a huge problem, and, and it's not just in the hardware, it's also in the software. It's a complete system type of approach to this. How do you ensure that all of this works? It's almost the, the understanding on a very high level of this is what you want your chip to do, and this is how you want it to behave, and this is your, the parameters that you have to work within. How do you deal with that? So one of the big challenges is knowing what you've done. You know, when you actually implemented the power sequences, what happens when you're transitioning from drowsy state to deep sleep, or waking up you know, in the middle of, of some strange sequence, knowing what happened to the actual data transportation in your design, being able to explore that and visually see certain domains off while other domains are on and what happened as uh, data flowed through the registers is part of what our tool enables. And this is all happening with formal analysis, so you can do both you know, formal exhaustive checks to make sure that you've uh, you know, created the right power management scheme, but you can also explore it. And I think that exploration is what kind of carries throughout uh, the design cycle and helps people see, uh, kind of connect what they're doing, what they're implementing, back to the intent. We soon do have finally made peace in the power format world with uh, UPF uh, uh, IEEE 1801. Does that allow us to move forward at now and put this behind us, or are we still dealing with some issues there that haven't been dealt with? Well, those of us who have been around EDA a while know that the standardization process is a long and arduous one. And even once you have this so-called piece, or actually real piece, you know, in power format uh, specification, you have a whole chain of EDA tools at each vendor that have to be updated and improved and, and made to work together. And so we're very excited that we see uh, coming together of UPF and CPF and, and the IEEE uh, format, uh, but we don't see that format in any EDA tool flow yet. So what we, the approach that we at Jasper are taking is to work with our key customers and see which subsets of which format they need. Many of them need pieces of both UPF and CPF. So we are working with them to make sure that we support uh, the pieces they need and not all of the elements uh, and, and uh, semantics of UPF relate to the functionality and what needs to be checked um, formally. So we just have to be ever vigilant and work with both of them. 
Let's talk about formal for a, a minute. Formal has always been one of those technologies that everybody said, yeah, we, this is going to be very good, uh, lots of use for this. The problem has been writing the assertions, and most engineers don't think in terms of being able to do that. How do you overcome that? Well, let me tackle the first part of your paragraph first, because it, it sounds great to me that you say formal has always sounded like something that's going to be really valuable and, and, and a lot of people are going to be able to use it. Actually, that was not the case. You know, when I joined Jasper uh, 10 years ago, or when we became Jasper 10 years ago, uh, it, formal used to be the thing a PhD user sat over in a corner and used and it was pretty detached from the actual you know, design implementation and what they were verifying might have been you know, chopped down or abstracted or something, and yet it was still valuable. What's happened and uh, where we have brought formal and seen it evolve is that now it is available for the masses. Certain applications can be specifically targeted at uh, specific problems like yeah, everything from the very simplest um, uh, connectivity verification to control and status register verification to X propagation detection and then all the way up the stack to things like architectural val validation and modeling and um, system level deadlock detection. So back to the assertions, all of these applications of formal need properties and some of the apps have the properties that are automatically extracted or generated from the RTL or from whatever the uh, source format may be, IP exact, if customers are using that standard, or their own flavor of spreadsheet that we can uh, build gaskets to. And so the properties are king into what it is that you're verifying. And um, having engineers write assertions for user-defined properties for certain functionality they want to verify is actually quite easy. Uh, one of my uh, application engineering uh, stars says, hey, I can teach somebody in two hours everything they need to know about System Verilog to do a lot of verification, very high coverage, uh, formal verification. And part of that is that uh, the tool, Jasper Gold, you know, our base platform, actually has, uh, helps the user to capture assertions by clicking on waveforms and showing cause and effect and it creates the assertions for them. They can see what the code looks like. They say, oh, okay, that's what that handshake looks like written in S you know, SVA, as an SVA or a PSL assertion. And then they learn from there. We also uh, ship many, many, many examples of property sets uh, on our uh, website called, System, uh, called Formal Expert so that uh, you're teaching the fishermen to fish. So really, having people write assertions is, is not really a big problem anymore. Our customers find that uh, with the help of their application engineers and the training that, uh, and the resources that come with it, that this is really a, kind of a solved problem. But one thing that does change is that you're looking for problems differently. So with formal, what you're trying to do is break the chain somewhere else than what you would normally do in other verification, right? Uh -huh. Now that is a really key point. Uh, you do have to think differently with formal. You have to think about what's the rule that must always or never happen. And teaching people to uh, apply that at the right level is indeed uh, you know, the big methodology change. They're coming from a world where verification meant predominantly simulation, and that was empirical. And it's all about stimulus and response. How do I stimulate the design and what response do I get? And I have to have a way to check that response to see that it's correct. And with formal, of course, you are specifying the check or the rule and then constraining what is legal or illegal on the inputs and letting uh, formal analysis exhaustively verify or prove uh, whether or not uh, you can violate it. Actually, I like to think of it this way. You're reverse engineering what violations are possible not you, the tool is reverse engineering what violations are possible, rather than testing a whole lot of sequences of, of things. And that, that takes some getting used to. It's actually quite liberating, but since we all, most of us that came from verification uh, or design have been trained to think about the cycles, you know, the, the simulator clock ticks and the uh, cycle by cycle vectors or waveforms, it is hard to step back from that and realize that you can think in a much more powerful way. So I guess that's the part that, uh, requires the training, not the actual coding of the assertions. Let's talk about functional verification here for a minute and the functional side of things because one of the problems that we're starting to encounter is so many different things going on, uh, particularly with power, that it's becoming overwhelming. You've got uh, multiple power islands, you've got uh, electromigration, you've got signal integrity issues, you've got contention for memory and 
uh, cache coherency, you've got um, multiple cores. And so the complexity that you're having to wrestle with in all this stuff is very difficult. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, it's growing almost exponentially at each new node. Are we getting to the point where we will not be able to solve this in the future? To that, I would say no. If you think about what is electronic design automation, it's about disruptions. It's about having a problem get so painful that you have to step back and think of a different way to do things. And uh, I, as I was saying earlier, since I started my career as a design engineer, EDA has delivered five orders of magnitude of engineering productivity, but it wasn't in a straight line. There were a lot of disruptions or paradigm shifts along the way. And even if, if you narrow down, narrow down to functional verification, I've been involved in three of them. One was the advent of emulation, second one was constrained random simulation, and now formal. And it, to your question, can formal, or maybe the implied question of can formal handle some of these uh, effects, the asynchronous clock effects, the, the separate power domains and all that. I think the, that is in fact the key to why Jasper has grown so fast. We have actually found a way to take formal verification or model checking, which was cycle-based, fully digital, all of that, and overlay on that the modeling of asynchronous glitches and clock effects from, from whether it be power domains shifting on and off or the interfaces to analog circuitry. Uh, we, don't do the an we don't include the analog circuitry in the formal analysis, but we absolutely model what is the effect of the analog on the digital and, and things such as that. So you look at uh, everything from the clock domain crossings and the you know, power clamps and body biasing and all those different things. Uh, those are all contained within uh, the apps of Jaspers that um, work with the basic model checking so that you're able to get uh, power aware formal analysis and or asynchronous clocking aware formal analysis and we were the first to do that. I think we've taken formal in directions that even I would not have thought possible uh, 10 years ago. Catherine Cranin, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for the opportunity Ed.